Good morning. Good morning, everyone from Hong Kong. Uh, I am Alice Wong, Executive Director of Asia Society Hong Kong Center, and I'm delighted uh, that to welcome uh, you to our program this morning. I myself uh, have just come out of quarantine yesterday after 21 days. And uh, one of the things that I did to pass my time was to read. And I'm delighted that one of the books that I had the pleasure of reading during my quarantine, uh, Home is Where We Are, uh, the author, Professor Wang Kong Wu, is going to be speaking with us. Uh, and uh, we have, we're delighted that our chairman, uh, Ronnie Chen, can moderate this session. And, and Ronnie can give you a bit more background with uh, Professor Wong's connection with uh, Asia Society Hong Kong. So I'm delighted and welcome back, uh, welcome myself back. Uh, it's been a while since I've been online to welcome, to do um, programs uh, like this. Uh, you know, with the COVID situation improving in Hong Kong, we're gonna be continue to do programs hybrid as well as online programs. And we look forward to welcoming all of you to join us. And uh, in, we have a lot of program coming up in May for in honor of, Asian Pacific Islander Month. I know it's an American tradition, but what's really interesting about that um, uh, APA Heritage Month is looking about our heritage, especially Asian American or Asian heritage. And Professor Wong's book, uh, you know, is really symbolizes that. So I highly recommend it. And it's available at Asia Society Hong Kong Bookstore, both in Chinese and in English. So pick one up, uh, quarantine or not, it's a great read. And I highly recommend it. It really helped me. Um, in fact, uh, gone through the quarantine in a great style. So thank you, Professor Wong, for your, your you at Margaret's writing. I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. And right with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our, um, our chairman, Ronnie Chen, to get the formal part of the program started. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Alice. Uh, I wanna welcome also the collaborating organizations for this program, that is, that is the Malaysian uh, Chamber in Hong Kong and Macau, as well as the Singapore Chamber. We're delighted to work with you. Gangbu, just for information, uh, some of our friends from Malaysia and Singapore have rented rooms in a nearby hotel by a society uh, and then abiding by social distancing rules uh, in place right now. Nonetheless, they are gathering in hotel rooms to watch you together uh, through YouTube and, uh, and Facebook and so forth. Many, many more are watching you and you are wonderful. Uh, before I uh, ask, I invite Professor Wong to uh, make some uh, initial remarks. I just want to say that uh, Professor Wang has had many, many distinguished uh, career uh, achievements, but to me, the highest that he has ever achieved was that he was a founding council member of the Asia Society Hong Kong. I have his papers with me in 1990, uh, and we were not yet formed as an organization that came in March 1991. Uh, so truly, you are a founder of ours, and I'm your junior. I only joined in 1992. Uh, and so we served together for about three years. Uh, we have done many programs uh, since that time with you, uh, but I have somehow not had the pleasure of uh, moderating any of them until today, so I'm delighted. Uh, I want to uh, uh, just begin, I, I want to bring everyone to this book. Uh, as you all know, this is uh, the latest book from Professor Wong. His first book uh, is up to his 19 years of age, that thick. This is his uh, second book, up to the age of 38, and uh, that thing. And my question to Gung Wu, the uh, last question of Gung Wu is, when is the third one coming out, and the fourth, and the fifth? And I expect that. But before uh, I turn it over to you, Gung Wu, I never seen this photograph in my life, although we've known each other for a long time. And I think that I'm sorry to say this, Gung Wu, everybody who look at that photograph is immediately attracted to Margaret, not you, I'm sorry. Uh, everyone who look at Margaret, many of you know her as an elegant, elegant, thoughtful, intelligent lady, but not, most of us didn't know, when, didn't know her when she was that young. And my, she was stunning. What happened? And I, was, I began to ask the question. I said, that's a handsome young man next to her. Are you sure that is really Gang Wu? He is extraordinarily handsome. So Gang Wu, I'm so happy that through this book, I know you. Uh, and Margaret a little bit more. Uh, with that, I will ask uh, Kung Wu, uh, I don't think that there's a need to go uh, into all your life uh, stories and so on the two books. I think many of us have read it. Uh, I just want to uh, uh, invite uh, Professor Wang to perhaps make uh, four or five minutes uh, to uh, anything you want to say, any uh, summary you want to make or any point you want to raise. Today, I will ask three sets of questions. The first one is, launching from your books, 
uh, about you know family, about home, about and then extended it to Guoja, uh, to the Chinese, uh, and you are trained by your uh, late father in the matter of Wen. Uh, that is really the essence very much of Chinese uh, languages, Chinese history and culture. So uh, uh, th these are very interesting subjects. So the first one is the book, Home. The second one is the Guoja, the national home, if you will. Uh, uh, not necessarily a geographic concept, uh, but I'll let you explain that and we can extend that. Historians usually give us some of the best perspective on the future. And so I'd like to uh, perhaps touch upon that a little, how you see uh, China, how you see uh, Southeast Asia, uh, and how you see US-China relation. Then finally, we'll expand it even beyond that uh, and see uh, any thought you may have concerning the world that is to come or the world that we're living in, which is to me very troubling uh, so with that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome Professor Kang Wu Wang. Kang Wu would like to make some initial comments first. Thank you, Ronnie. I mean, I'm very grateful for you for and, and Ching for helping to sell my book. Uh, that's, that's, that's always very helpful. And of course, uh, having uh, Margaret on the front page of the second volume also was meant to attract you to buy my book. <laughs> <laughs> with you, she absolutely steals the show. Uh, for myself, the story is actually very simple. You, you summed it up in very, well, very well in the word home. That's really what the first two, two, these two volumes is about. But I think the, that on the second one, let me simply say for this occasion that there are really three, three things I want to say. First of all is leaving China because China was home from the time I was a conscious as a young boy always thinking of preparing myself to go back to China. So China was home. So the book begins by having left China and leaving China was uh, painful, particularly to my parents actually, who spent all those years having been out in Southeast Asia, waiting to go home and finally getting there and being forced to leave and getting me to leave as well, because having told me all my life that I, I should go home to China and I was actually back there in a university to ask me to leave was actually a big decision for them. It was of course a big decision for me. As an only child, I felt I had to, I had to rejoin them. And having joined them in Malaya, the, the second part of the book as it were, is to, to return to Malaya where I grew up. Uh, but this was a different Malaya. It was not the Malaya that I remembered as a British protected state, uh, a Malay state. Um, you know, it's part of an enormous British empire, defeated by the Japanese. And when the J British returned, it was uh, really in a very helpless condition and about to, as it were, give up the empire and, and go home. So that was the context when I left Malaya to go to, to China. But when I returned from China to Malaya, it was a different Malaya. And my father, in his wisdom, thought that, well, we're We've left China, we're unlikely to go back, at least in his mind. So this is where you have to make your life um, fit in into this new country that to be called Malaya, which the British will eventually leave in, as an independent country. And I will try and get you to a university, which is the most important thing that was uh, on his mind, that I must never stop learning. Having sent me to a university and pulled me out, he was determined that I must get to university, but he didn't have the means to send me abroad. So the only university he could send me to, if he could, was to University of Malaya. But somehow it happened. I managed to do that, partly because I was actually qualified to be a federal citizen of this new country called Malaya, having lived long enough there from little child until I was uh, 19 years old. So being qualified, I think I, it helped me to get a admission into the new University of Malaya. At the university, this was something really new. I was actually faced with the question of a new home, a new country that was about to be built. At, the, at that time, undefined, nobody was quite clear what this country was being like. But since I was coming in as a new federal citizen with rights as a citizen, I actually had a part to play. And this was important to me because 
all my life I had been a Hua Chiao, a temporary resident abroad. And here was I, for the first time, faced with the possibility of being a member of a new nation, a new nation that would accept me as a citizen. So I was conscious of that. I was also conscious of the fact that all Hua Chiao, uh, being Chinese at a time when China was turning into the Pe People's Republic of China, all Hua Chiao was suspect as being loyal to China and potentially communist and therefore a threat to the basically anti-communist uh, states that this, the British were leaving behind. So in that context, to escape from that kind of suspicion, a kind of willingness to participate in this nation building seemed to be a very good uh, uh, choice to make. I wasn't sure whether I would be acceptable, but in any case, I, I concentrated on my studies. So that was the thing was I had a chance to return to studying. So what did I study? Eventually I studied to be a historian and decided to try and study Chinese history. But in the context of that time, studying modern China was suspect, and particularly by a Chinese who had just returned from China with Hua Chao roots and, and, and had been a Chinese citizen all my life until 1949 until I became a federal citizen. So studying modern China was sort of out of the question in many ways. So I, I decided to study ancient China. And it's in that context that I became a historian of all those thousands of years of Chinese history. And I must confess, I enjoyed it very much. So this question of going back to China and then being fascinated by the idea that China was back again as a reunified country, this time under the Communist Party. But of course, after about half a century of division, and why the division? And how, how is it that China has always been so divided and so divided and then and gets unified again? So the, the theme of division, fragmentation, and reunification became uppermost in my mind through, as I studied China. The more I studied Chinese history, the Sorry, more I was concerned sure with that. that. So it's in that context that uh, I, I particularly wanted to follow up on, on, on Chinese history. So that is where I, as you, as you can see, in my years as an academic, my young years as an academic, was trying to become a historian of China. And you can see me struggling in the context of a new country, which was suspicious of a new China. And at the same time, trying to work with the best historians of China that I could meet and learn from. And I think that would be a set enough to, for me to say about what, what this book is trying to, to convey. Thank you, Gang Wu. Uh, you chose the word home as the central word for your two books, that which some people will consider as, well, it, it, it is your earlier bi biography of early years. But this concept of home to you uh, was defined in a very uh, personal way. Uh, it is not necessarily a geography. It is not necessarily a nation. Uh, you mentioned that you grew up, well, you were, you were born in uh, Sorajaya in uh, Indonesia, lived in Ipoh, went to China for a little bit, went back to uh, Malaysia, Malaya in those days. Uh, and then uh, in 1968, you moved to Australia and was there until you came to Hong Kong. Thank God for Hong Kong University who uh, uh, hired you. It's so good for, our, for Hong Kong. Uh, and so you were here for what, 10 years roughly? And that's when you became the council member of the ASA Society from 1986 to 1995. And then you chose Singapore as your home. So you are a vagabond, you have no home in a sense. So I suppose somebody, a poor man like you, uh, in the terms of home, would have to find a home. Uh, and so I just wonder if that your definition of home is forced upon you. Let me ask you two hypothetical questions. The first one is, if after 1945, China suddenly, bingo, became the United States. You did mention that you would regret a little bit, you know, perhaps intellectually not having been earlier, uh, worked more in the United States, although later you were, high, you were hired by Stanford and many other universities, uh, Columbia. But, you know, uh, was it forced upon you because you don't have a home? If China in 1945 suddenly turned into the United States or somehow went on a very, very positive path uh, for the future years, uh, would you have changed 
would home to you then be more a geog geographic uh, concept uh, and or perhaps even a national one rather than home being confined to where you, Margaret, and later the three girls are? I think you're right that I didn't have any choice when I was, when I was young. Home was just defined by my parents, China. And it was an imagined China. It wasn't the China of civil war and war with Japan and all the terrible things that were happening to China during those years I was growing up in Malaya. But it was China as a kind of ideal China. The China that in my parents' mind, particularly in my father's mind, the China in which a civilization had developed over thousands of years at its heart, at its core, Confucian values, but also colored by all the other contributions to Chinese uh, civilization, to making it such a glorious one in, in, in the minds of the, particularly the literati class, the educated classes of China. And for, for him, that was China. And he tried to convey that to me indirectly without spelling it out in that way, but it gave me the sense of that China is the one that you should admire and we are returning to China one day. But it was a China very much in his mind and he tried to transmit that to my mind and I understood it to some extent, but in a very naive and in a, an innocent way without fully grasping what it really meant. So having arrived in Nanjing and got to university, I was home, this was home. Uh, the, in, on, on the ground, not just an idea now, but a place located in a university on a campus in the, in the city, which was the capital of the country. So you can't be more central than that to be in the capital, in the, in the, in the, in the country's the largest university. I said it was very privileged and I found there, there I was, I was home. But then it turned out that home is not here. Uh, it, it was not here when I was in Malaya and when I was in China, it, I had to leave it because home was not here, because here was a battleground of people, political parties, ideologies, armies fighting bitterly, millions of people involved in the battlefront, thousands of people dying almost every day in the, in the battlefront in the civil war when Chinese were killing Chinese. I mean, it was that home. So in a way, I was already disorientated by all that. So by the fact that my parents went back to Malaya and called me back and I followed behind, again, I don't think I had a choice. I had to go and join them, being the only child. But having done that, then I was faced, then I had a choice. In Malaya, I had a choice. I could actually belong to this new nation and I actually could belong to a new university and, and learn a new skill and profession and be a scholar and work in a university. These are now choices. And most of all, I have to say, probably the most important choice and the wisest choice I made was to meet Margaret and ask her to be my wife. Now that, that of course, made all the difference. And of course, that is why it led ultimately to the possibility of that choice that Margaret said, home is where we are. So in a way, if your career takes you somewhere else, offers different opportunities elsewhere, so be it because as long as we are together, we are home. And so that ends the story in that, in that very positive note, although the question mark remains, where is home? Uh, so the only thing I can say is that for the rest of our lives, until uh, uh, I lost Margaret, uh, we were home because we were always together. Thank you. Uh, apart, my apologies. Uh, Ming is a, a son. You have one son and two daughters, not three daughters. Uh, anyway, uh, but second hypothetical question. Kang Wu, you are really, really fortunate to have found, uh, found Margaret, and that was your choice and her choice. Yeah. Uh, but what? Not, not everybody is as fortunate as you are. There are many other Hua Chao who have a similar history and background as you do, and not quite exactly because you are a little bit unique, not just in your intellect, but also being a Jiang Sunese and all that stuff. But you found Margaret and hence home, you have an alternative to what home is to you. If you are unfortunate like somebody else and don't have that kind of a, uh, a, a loving marriage family, uh, then where would home be? So extend that to the Hua Chao. Uh, what happened? What, what is their concept? of uh, jia or wajia, what, 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 what is 
on their head. You know this better than any of us. You are the one who led the uh, world in studying the overseas Chinese. One of the things I learned in my life is that never forget that all of us, each and every one of us, also needs luck. How do you define this luck? I don't, I don't associate it with fate or destiny. I think those are the wrong words. Luck is a very positive thing, particularly in the Chinese mind. When the Chinese talk about yun qi, wan hei, that luck is a dynamic thing. It's, a, it's something that's happening around you. It is there. It offers opportunities, but you never quite know when it comes and when it doesn't come. But you should always be alert, watchful of those opportunities. And then luck means something, becomes a positive thing. You don't just sit there waiting for the, for, for the, for the, for the goal to land on your feet uh, and, and, and do nothing about it. You're actively keeping an eye open for opportunities. That is actually the, at the core, the heart of the meaning of luck. And the Chinese idea of luck, which is positive, do whatever you can to see so that you don't miss out when luck passes by. And then when you see it coming and you recognize it as your luck, and if you, and you, that is a luck in itself, that you're able to catch it and recognize it, that is your moment of fortune, grab it. And that grabbing it at that moment can make a difference to your life. So meeting Mark is just one example. I mean, there are other things, choices of my life in my career, choosing to study China. Why did I do a particular aspect of China? And why did I pick some other subject and not some, uh, some other subject? Uh, some of it has, you, know, you don't have much choice because you're forced, as I said, I was forced to avoid modern China. So I went to ancient China. In ancient China, I decided to look at maritime China, maritime trade of China. And that became very interesting for the rest of my life because it was also related to us being Nanyang Hua Chao in, uh, outside on, uh, in, the maritime, in the maritime part of the world of outside China. And then, at, and then at the end of it all, I was always interested in why the China was so divided and why it could reunify. So the idea of division, fragmentation and reunification was always at the back of my mind because I watched it in my lifetime. And I saw that as a, that I saw that as a problem throughout Chinese history all through ancient history down to all the way to Yuan Mingqing and then to the Mingguo, there was fragmentation, division and reunification. And that became a, a kind of running theme at the back of my mind. So when I went to study uh, for my doctorate, I took on the period, the Wudai, the five dynasties. And not because I was interested in any of those dynasties, but I was interested in the fact that China was probably at its most divided in, in all its history during the 10th century in China. It was so divided, it was called five dynasties and 10 kingdoms. And that's how divided, well, that's how, more. Yeah, how fragmented it was. So how could this five kingdoms, and 10 kingdoms and five dynasties end up unified again? Not totally, but by the Song, not totally. In fact, China remained divided for the next three centuries until it was united by the Mongols. So that again was a great puzzle in my mind then why was it that unification could not be done by the Chinese themselves during the whole of the five dynasties and 10 kingdoms? When they tried to do it, they failed. There were, they were always Khitans, Georgians, Tanguts, Mongols and others threatening China throughout that time. There were problems in the Southwest and the West and the North at all time, until it was the Mongols who reunified China. Now that was another great puzzle in my life that we needed, an, as it were, an external power, not Chinese at all in its uh, political system and, and so on, to actually bring China together. And when they brought it together, the Chinese inherited it afterwards, after driving the Mongols out, they inherited a unified China. Now, how, how extraordinary. They couldn't do it themselves, but it was the Mongols having done it for them, they were able to inherit it and then make it really Chinese. So the Ming, in a way, took as a model the, the, the unified China of Han and the Tang. So that was, a, again, a, an eye-opening experience for me to recognize that. And then when the Manchus took over China, basically they ran China like the Ming dynasty did. They didn't change very much. They had a, on top, they had Manchus on top, aristocrats. But the way the Chinese part, the 18 provinces were run, were really run exactly as the Ming dynasty had run it. 
and they allowed the Chinese to, to do most of, the, most of the work of administering that China. They themselves had other uh, uh, areas to, to deal with, Mongols and in, into Tibet and Xinjiang and, and so on. That was the Manchu problem. But where the China problem was concerned, there was a unified China that, that, they, that the Manchus had conquered from the Ming and that remained unified throughout that time. So the Mongol unification in the 13th century was really a turning point, a major turning point for a united, unified China until 1911. And what happens when you break down the Qing, when you overthrow the dynastic state or the Tianxia that the Qing represented, you start to have a republic, you start to have a nation, and then what happened? Division again. Very fierce divisions, first among the warlords, and then among two contending political parties, all both of them armed, bitterly hating each other, willing to kill each other for another dozen years or so. And then invaded by the Japanese, a real threat to the survival of this, uh, this, this China, and, and tremendously dangerous, an existential, existential problem for the Chinese. And the fact that they managed to survive that and ultimately be reunified again by the Chinese Communist Party. And some people would argue the Chinese Communist Party is not entirely Chinese. It was modeled on a completely external uh, system of the, of the Soviet Union and inspired by what the Russians had done uh, under the Bolsheviks and, to, and it was the Communist International that inspired the Chinese to, to build the Communist Party. And that the Communist Party was in a way, again, reunified with external influences external ideas. And in, in, from another angle, you can say the same thing happened. They were reunified by the fact they had to oppose imperialism, whether it was imperialism from the West or the Soviet communism from, from Eastern Europe, they were both from outside. It was in response to that. And in a way influenced by both those factors from imperialism as well as communism that the new China in 1949 emerged. So once again, external factors had such a high role to play in the reunification of China. And this time, not just reunify the China of the Ming and the Song and the Han and the Tang, but this time reunifying a China that was based on the territories com com uh, commanded and conquered by the Manchu Qing dynasty. And, and the territory of China today is more or less, except for Mongolia, more or less the borders of the Qing Empire. That is completely new. Again, very new to the, to the Chinese. And to this day, the Chinese are still facing this problem, the challenge of making this new reunified China into something new that is called, might be called a party nation. A nation with one party, not just a one party state, but the only party that the party nation is the, is the, the actual structure of the new China that is going to face the world and that is and it's done very well, since, particularly since the Deng Xiaoping reforms, the country is now very successful. And to, to the surprise of many, it is now the number two economy in the world and challenging in the eyes of the United States, challenging their dominance in the world, something that is, was unthinkable just a few decades ago. So this is, this is my lifetime of learning. Having left China, having gone outside of China, I've been learning and studying this China uh, of, of thousands of years and finding it an exciting adventure and I'm still learning. Well, frankly, Gangu, if you had stayed in Nanjing in 1949, you probably, if you are still alive, you may not have, you probably would not have the opportunity to pursue the research uh, and study that you did. Uh, I, I really appreciate what you said about not having choices sometimes. Um, you are not just a historian, you are a, as much an educator. And I think this word is so necessary for the young people today. You mentioned that in your first 19 years, you hardly had any choices, very little choices of your own. Even after that, you still have very little choices. Your really one big choice that you made, which you made very well, was to uh, marry uh, Margaret. Uh, that was, I think, more of her choice. But anyway, uh, <laughs> so, 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 so not having choices recognizing luck in a positive sense. Uh, and then uh, you also, something else you excel, and that is you excel in learning, in study, in improving yourself. You talk about how you learn all the dialects 
uh, during those three and a half years uh, of the Japanese rule in Malaya, and you couldn't do uh, go to school, and then you learn dialect yourself. And that's why you were able to come to Hong Kong and be able to speak Cantonese, I assume, during your years at Hong Kong U. How many dialects do you speak, by the way, Tongo? Oh, they've been sort of fading away a bit. I, I could speak Hakka in Cantonese quite well. Hokkien was also always the wrong kind of Hokkien because the Hokkien that I learned was Penang Hokkien. And for the genuine Fujian people, or shaman people, they say that is a corrupted, corrupted form of Hokkien, so I can't claim that to be a, a Hokkien speaker. But Hakka in Cantonese, I, I was quite comfortable with, but today not having a chance to, chances to speak Cantonese or Hakka very much in Singapore, I'm afraid uh, neither dialect, uh, I'm fluent in neither now. I, I can, How about manage, I can I can manage, but not as well as I would like to. Okay, uh, back to the question of the Hua Chao, the overseas Chinese, uh, or whatever is the right politically uh, correct term. Um, when the last 200 years, China was really, as you well described, in a pretty weak state until recently. And so a lot of people were, Chinese were driven out uh, for one reason or another, economic, political, whatever. Uh, and your father, I suppose, was one of those and you, yourself as well. And so the Hua Chao has developed into a very interesting bunch. Uh, but this is the first time perhaps in 200 plus years when China itself as a nation is strong and rising. So how do you see that impacting on the uh, Hua Chao, the overseas Chinese uh, and where will that lead? Would that cause them trouble? They may have a uh, Macabism, uh, the Hua Chao style in Southeast Asia. Is that something of concern to you as China rises economically and influence-wise in the world? Well, one of the interesting things that happened when I returned to Malaya was that over a period of about a decade or so, we all realized that as we become attached to and gain a certain a new kind of loyalty to the new nation as we become citizens of those countries and we accept the new nationality, we are no longer Hua Chao. We have settled in those countries. We had adopted a new nationality. We are now the Hua Ren or ethnic Chinese who are nationals and loyal to the country of adoption, the countries of adoption. Now that became the norm from the 1960s onwards. So that original group of Hua Chao that were there before the war in the, up to the 1950s really became nationals. And I would say the majority of them are absolutely loyal to their countries. That's one generation. So when we talk about Hua Chao today, I don't think we're using the word today. We use it now, things like Xin Yimin. The, Xin new, Yimin. the new migrants from, particularly from China, not so much from Hong Kong or Taiwan, but Taiwan and Hong Kong, they were still part of the Hua Chao group early on. But the Xin Yimin from the opening of China after Deng Xiaoping's reforms, so the last 40 or 50 years, we have Xin Yimin. Now these people uh, have not yet decided what to do. Many of them are still, uh, maybe they are, they've taken permanent, res permanent residence but, uh, and have a green card, uh, but they're not completely committed yet. They still have that possibility of either settling or returning to China. Now that is a, a kind of transition stage and how the local government and the Chinese government relate to these people is still open to possibilities. And in fact, both sides, the, the government who wants to keep the Chinese and keep them loyal and the Chinese who would like to retain relationships and connections with them are, are trying to be very nice to, 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 to these Chinese people. And that's quite right. And they are not yet decided. But amongst them, of course, are those who are committed. They are out there briefly, temporarily, and are real Hua Chao. They are only temporarily abroad, and eventually they will learn whatever they can and will return to China to serve, the, to serve their country. That, and, and perfectly open about it. They're not, they're not secretive about it. That is what they do. Others have determined that they will settle abroad. They are not going back to China. They're not yet rich citizenship, maybe they're in the stage of trying to become a citizen and they have got to go through uh, different stages. But the fact is that they are determined not to go back to China and make their homes abroad. So there's a, a the variety of uh, Chinese now, the, particularly from the Xin Yimin, the variety among the Xin Yimin is much greater than 
among the old Lao Hua Chao who have more or less settled down. So you have to distinguish between the two. And what is very uh, alarming is that, of course, among foreigners, they don't make the difference. As far as they're concerned, you, you just look Chinese, you are Chinese, and if you, if you suspect the Chinese or don't like the Chinese, you don't, you don't bother to, to determine whether this is when a loyal Chinese has become a citizen, and in fact, a patriotic uh, uh, citizen of your country, or whether he's a potential uh, fifth column uh, for, on behalf of China. You, you don't bother because you look at him and his, look at him or her and say, he looks Chinese and therefore suspicious. And that brings out a kind of racism, which is very alarming. That part, the kind of racial, some form of racial discrimination that has reappeared in many, many societies, that is alarming. This is new. It has actually, it was there before, it had died down and almost sort of uh, disappeared for a while, but now it has come back, I think, quite strongly and likely to stay that way as long as there is a real threat of conflict between the Western powers and the, the People's Republic of China. And there, of course, we're, we're still, the, the progress, it's a civil work in progress. We don't know what the outcome will be, but this is a, a stage which is extremely uncomfortable for anyone who looks Chinese and has a Chinese name or admits to being a Chinese. And these are tough times. What is most unfortunate in countries like uh, uh, some countries, they can't even tell the difference between Chinese, Japanese, Koreans, and other Asians. And that, of course, affects other people, which is a great uh, pity. That's not, not their, their fault. But this is the result of, of, of a racist uh, 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 response to suspicion between powers that are now thinking about how the world should be divided. And the idea that a, a divided world uh, would be between China and the rest, so to speak, is, is something that to me is, is a ridiculous idea, but it is something that is being promoted by some people. And behind that, of course, un undoubtedly there will arise a lot of racist behavior. And that I think would be a great pity and something I, I really hope will not stay too long. And there are also in some countries a religious overlay, uh, which then add uh, fuel to fire, uh, which I suppose can be even more worrying to uh, the people that are living there. Uh, anyway, uh, later I will come back to this identity issue because uh, which is something that you are an expert on so much uh, uh, relating to Hong Kong. I'm melding a lot of questions uh, that I am receiving from the audience into what I'm asking. So some of these questions are not, not necessarily mine, but theirs, but that doesn't matter. So as a historian, Dong Wu, uh, you lived uh, for the most of your 90 years so far uh, under a very weak Chinese. Uh, but now there's no denying that uh, PRC uh, is uh, economically rising and hence in terms of its influence in the world. And many Americans are afraid of uh, Chinese hegemony. Uh, I suppose some people say that uh, uh, the Westerners have this colonial xin uh, uh, you know, this uh, attitude, and hence uh, colonize us. Uh, we never colonize anyone, uh, at least not I don't not that I know of really. Uh, and uh, even when uh, uh, Zheng He went all the way to Africa, we did not take any land. We just bought them giraffes and. Uh, <laughs> and what have you. Uh, and, and, and so how do you see um, China's future uh, as it gains strength and position in the world? Uh, will it go the way of the West and become a hegemon like what America today is portraying China into? Or you think that there's a fair chance uh, from a historic perspective that China will go a different way and be, remain peaceful and become a factor of peace in the world? Can you comment, please? Well, um, a powerful China is a new experience for most of us because most of us lived through a, a period when China of was basically divided and weak. So it's only in the last 20 years that we're really seriously looking at a China that is potentially very powerful. So this is something new and I think we're all thinking about it. I really don't believe any one of us know exactly what will happen. I mean, if you follow the Chinese traditions and what they had been, they had been doing in the past, then they're unlikely to 
want to dominate the world because they are very practical people. And looking at the American example, they know that it can't be done. And if you try to do it, you will actually probably cause more harm to yourself in the long run and be no help at all to anybody. So that, that is something that is uh, uh, over ambitious and ultimately self-destructive. I think the looking at the examples of those countries that tried to dominate the world, they all did not end happily or at all well. I think the Chinese would be aware of that. But what they are constantly worried about is the defense of China itself, the security of China itself. And this is part of their history. It is in a way in the genes of the Chinese when I, I had already outlined earlier on how the times when the Chinese were invaded again and again. I mean, right from the beginning, from the days when China was supposed to be so powerful, like the Han Dynasty, they were threatened by the Xiongnu almost all through the Han Dynasty. And soon after the Han Dynasty came to an end, the division into the three kingdoms, the, 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 all these tribal confederations from outside China burst into China. We have what they call the period of Wu Hu Luan Hua, the five tribal federations, and they include Manchus, Mongols, Tibetans, Turks, the, the whole lot of them all entered into China and in fact uh, caused utter confusion for almost uh, altogether for about one or two centuries and then turned into a divided China between North and South and it ultimately re reunified under the Sui and the Tang. But in that case, reunified by people who are partly those invaders. They're not pure Chinese anymore. They, whether the Sui or the Tang, they all intermarried with all these invaders who had broken into Han China uh, a couple of hundred years earlier. So when you bear that in mind, you can understand why the Chinese are always much more fearful about it. Even the Tang Dynasty, we all talk about the Tang Dynasty as a great dynasty, but the Tang Dynasty as a powerful united country lasted not more than 150 years because by the time of Xuanzong, when we talk about the idea, the time of Yang Guifei and so on, we have the Anrushan Rebellion, which basically ended the, the powerful Tang Dynasty. Because after that, Tang Dynasty was already fragmenting from within with the local powers in every province with military, uh, private military armies uh, controlling them. Eventually ending up with the five dynasties that I talked about, it was fragmentation, increasingly fragmented until it broke up altogether in the 10th century and then spent another two or 300 years with the Song struggling to survive in, in a very in a, in a situation where it was basically divided. It was defending itself. Uh, why the stories of UFA, for example, why do we, the Chinese have this idea that UFA was the great hero? He actually failed, he did not succeed. But what he stood for was a desperate attempt for the Song Dynasty to survive enemy after enemy from Kitans, Georgians, Totangus, Mongols, and so on. And that's surviving. And that's all about, that's all the story was about until it was the whole, the whole place was conquered co totally by the Mongols. So when you think about that, the security of China, in those days, of course, the enemy was overland, but the security of China was a cloud over China almost all through its history. And then to their utter surprise, the enemy came by sea in the 19th century. And for the first time, they were completely overwhelmed by sea, so much so that a small neighbor like Japan who had never threatened China before could actually defeat the Chinese so badly at sea, destroying its whole Navy and then begin to invade China and really threaten the existence, the very survival of China itself. Now that all that could happen by sea. So now they realize that the enemy is not just overland, it could also come by sea. So the question of security of China, you can understand why Chinese political leaders up, up to just a few decades ago, were obsessed with this question of being weak and divided. If you're weak and divided, you are vulnerable and continually put, uh, put, uh, uh, inviting people to intervene and, and, and break you up. And I think this is a genuine nightmare for any Chinese leader. And I, I, I imagine this must remain so for quite some time yet. So that part of it, I think we mustn't underestimate. I mean, instead of emphasizing what it's going to do to the rest of the world when it gets more and more powerful, I would say that at the moment, the major concern is how to keep China strong, prosperous, 
and the people really happy with the country so that there's no question of divisions within the country that other powers from outside can exploit and cause China to be divided and fragmented again. I think this is probably their greatest nightmare. And you put that in context, I think a lot of what is happening in, in, in the world today is better, is it's a better explanation of what is happening than the opposite view, which sees China as being aggressively showing its claws and how to, how to dominate everybody, how to bully everybody and threaten the great United States and the other Western powers. I think that picture is, is entirely artificially meant to do for other political purposes, for, the, for their national interests. I can, I can understand why they, they do that because they want to demonize China so that they can justify the policies they adopted to China. But it doesn't actually reflect what China is really about. What is China's primary concern? It's its own security and its ability to feel secure under circumstances, most of which is outside of their control. Well, that which come from the sea was not just the Japanese. In fact, the Japanese and the Ming Dynasty was already more or less roaming the shores of eastern shores of China with giving trouble. And then, of course, as you well said, 1895, there about the Japanese really uh, invaded big time uh, on the sea battle. But also the colonialists, they all came through the sea. Uh, and hence, uh, Hong Kong, Macau and Taiwan, you know, the Dutch, the Portuguese, the, uh, the, the British and, and, and so forth. And now that's why I suppose why. Taiwan is such a sensitive issue. Uh, if you get a comment, go, go ahead. If not, uh, the next question I have is a very general one. I'm incorporating a lot of the other, my, my, my members' question here. Uh, what about uh, the world today uh, with the rising of China, uh, the United States uh, <clears throat> uh, with a lot of domestic issues, and then Europe has been basically non-existent almost in, in political terms. I mean, Henry Kissinger, Helmut Schmidt, you know, these top leaders in the world both all told me that Europe doesn't count, but I suspect that Europe may be coming back. So how do you see this world of today and of tomorrow for, uh, from a, historic, a historian perspective? You're really asking a, a big question and it is a big question mark for almost everybody. Because, I'll come back uh, to the small ones later. Okay, after, after 1945, and especially after the collapse of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War, it was increasingly clear that the most powerful country was the United States, and the United States was the sole superpower, and it had, as it were, the possibility, or, and even the, uh, the, the, the hope, of becoming the, the country that would bring order to the world and make sure that the, the rule of law, that they, the, uh, the principles that they believe in can be uni universally applied everywhere. But what has happened is that, that, that is not going to, that's not going to happen. I mean, the, the, it is quite clear that no one power in the world today can control the world. And that the world is, is actually a very complicated place. And it, that there should be respect for each place having its own way of doing things. And the idea that you should take, take, make everybody the same, follow the same set of rules uh, as created out of the United Nations and the IMF and World Bank and all these other institutions after the war, it was a great hope. In fact, it was something I would say most of us shared with the possibility of that globalized world being something that actually brought us as human beings closer together. It actually hasn't happened. On the contrary, what has happened is that in the end, the, the opposite idea of nation states with national interests perfectly justified to protect their own interests and to defend themselves against the enemy. All these things are much more powerful than the globalizing forces which are, have benefited relatively few people. And so in that context it becomes more and more obvious that the majority of the people who have a say in their government and the say of what they want in their lives should actually determine the new world, not the elites who are well off and educated and who can move around the globe freely and so on. They are not the ones who determine the future of the world. The ordinary people who want to protect their, and, and protect their own interests and be secure and safe in their own lives, they're the ones that now want to have their say. And therefore a kind of populism is actually everywhere. And I think it's not only uh, Trump, in America and, and, and in the Democratic Party faces the same problem. But it actually, the same problem faces the Chinese Communist Party. The Chinese Communist Party is just as much as, just as concerned with being populist than any other 
country, of course, for the Communist Party, their legitimacy actually comes from the approval of the people. They don't, it doesn't have to be democratically elected in the usual forms and so on. Those are just uh, uh, methods or devices for, for, for doing certain things politically. But the fact is that if the, pop, if the people disagree with what you do so much that they rebel against you, that's the end of you. And, and it's true of all the Chinese dynasties in the past, and the CCP will not be any exception if they fail to satisfy the people. So in that sense, the CCP is no less populist than all the politicians in all the other nationalist countries in the world. Now, if this is going to spread and become more and more the dominant feature of political life, participated by more and more people through media, modern media, telecommunications, and so on. We, we know what everybody is doing. We're able to respond immediately, quickly, and in that instant moment can actually show your displeasure. I mean, we are, we are watching examples of this in many, many countries in the world today, not just in Asia, but in elsewhere as well. And you can see that this is a much more powerful force that is growing at the, at the level of the ordinary man. And he's not going to let go now. He has the capacity through social media and other means to show his dislike, his disapproval. He will show it now. And if governments fail to respond to that, they will fail. And this is a new test. And it's nothing to do with globalization and, and satisfying humanity in some broad idealistic way. At least this is what is threatening us at the moment. So many of us with ideals drawn from a, a one world uh, set of uh, universal laws and, and, and so on and so forth are probably very, uh, would be very disappointed that this is happening. But I think the reality is that this is happening, not because any one person's fault. It's the very fact that technology, the, wor the world, that now that we know each other better, we are people are much more concerned for their own security. They are more capable of defending themselves and they're using all the means, all the technology available to make sure that they, their lives, their own country will be protected against potential uh, enemies. And I think this become more and more the norm and the main focus. Everybody wants to say, my country first. And this is something that I think is unstoppable at the moment. I hope it will pass. If once it get, people get more secure, they will think afresh about the possibilities of human uh, co cooperation for climate change and all the other things that require us to cooperate. But this is a very dangerous moment when people are unwilling to take that risk because they are afraid that it would affect their own prosperity or security in their own countries. And this stage is, I think, I would say at a, at a, at a kind of turning point in, a way, in many ways. And this transition is very threatening to the, all the things that you and I have lived through in our youth. Well, Gangwu, you don't give me too much hope. Uh, populism, as you are absolutely correct, in China is as important in, as in the West. And uh, domestic politics always overflow overseas if you're powerful enough. Uh, there was a senator, I forgot his name, Arthur Vandenberg or something, that said, you know, let's make sure that our domestic uh, issues end at the border, at the, at the coasts, the two coasts uh, in America. But, you know, it never happens if you're powerful enough. And now with China also having the same thing, and populism oftentimes, 99% uh, of the time, are not rational. Uh, and, and there's a lot of things that comes into it that really becomes very worrying to me. Now, you said that these are big questions. Let me come to a very small question. And that is Hong Kong. Hong Kong is a dinky little place. You live here for 10 years. You love this place. From what I can tell, Gang Wu, uh, we work together a little bit here. Uh, so Hong Kong people has what, and you're an expert on identity. Uh, in, under the British, the Hong Kong, the, the British government makes sure that Hong Kong people have no national identity. They were afraid they identify with Taiwan or in the 50s, 60s, and then later with mainland China, uh, starting in the 70s, 80s, 90s. Uh, so they make sure that you have no national identity, nor do they want you to have British identity. They, they are afraid that you will all flood into London and Manchester. So Hong Kong people has no national identity whatsoever. And now suddenly we have one country. I heard what you said about one country, two system being this and that and the Georgia uh, and 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 so Suddenly, we have one country, and Hong Kong people never had the preparation to have any national identity. Uh, but now, we have no choice. Uh, some people embrace it. Other people are fighting it. 
uh, partly, of course, they're fighting uh, the communists, so to speak, uh, and America is helping uh, in a very un unhelpful way, in my opinion. So what is your advice to Hong Kong and to your students at Hong Kong U and other univer local universities on this matter of identity in Hong Kong? Uh, does it matter? Or if it matters, how will it shape the future of Hong Kong politically, socially, culturally? It's a good question. It's not a small question. It's a very, very big question because Hong Kong is not just a little island. Hong Kong has actually been always been a global city. It was linked up with a global British empire right, right from the beginning. It is always part of a chain of international ports of, and that chain has never been broken and even down to, to, to this day. And that the fact that Hong Kong has this global background has always made the position of Hong Kong somewhat more complicated. But at the same time, there's never been simple in, in even in, as a global city, because at the same time, the people of Hong Kong have actually, in, as I understand it, never stopped being Chinese. I mean, they may not call it a national identity, but they were never, they were never anything but Chinese. And they were constantly in touch with their hometowns, the people in Guangdong or Fujian particularly, but also in Shanghai and elsewhere. And that uh, the, the, the recognition that these were their, their roots, as it were, were, were never really lost, even from, the, from day one, from the day it became a colony of the British. And the and British always accepted that. They never asked the Chinese to be anything else. They knew the Chinese people who were flooding into Hong Kong were, were, were very closely linked to their homes in Guangdong or Fujian and, and were constantly in touch. And there were people who were moving in and out almost without, without any hesitation all that time until the borders became harder and harder over time. But all these developments are actually part and parcel of this contradiction, you might say, of being a global city on the one hand and being a Chinese population attached to China, involved in Chinese politics from the very beginning. I mean, right at the time that Hong Kong as, as a colony started, it started to affect the relations in Guangdong that led to the Taiping Rebellion and all the rebellions that, that occurred thereafter, the fights between Hakkas and Cantonese, the Sun Yat-sen, Kang yu Wei kind of uh, reforms, the Sun Yat-sen uh, re re rebellion and the, the, the setting up of the Republic of China, all these things, Hong Kong was involved in every major event in Chinese and modern Chinese history ever since it began. And the people of Hong Kong were never free from being obsessed, almost obsessed with the politics of China. And, and so many of them participated directly, either coming in and out of, of Hong Kong almost all that time. So in one sense, you can say Hong Kong didn't have an identity. In another sense, it's because they had a dual identity from the very beginning, wanting to be global and still wanting to be Chinese. And they never really try to reconcile the two. Both were legitimate, both are in their eyes uh, desirable, and they kept it that way. So I think the question at the moment is that what, what happened in 1997 was that the idea of, and you mentioned it, one country, two system, the idea of one country became prominent. Up to that point, nobody actually articulated it. It was assumed, but not articulated. But once it was articulated and made into law and internationally recognized, the documents deposited in the United Nations that Hong Kong was one country, although it has two systems, it was one country. That one country is hard to deny because that becomes uh, uppermost because it is one country first and the, the two systems come under one country. And whether we liked it or not, when that decision was made and whether people said they had a free choice or no, they had no choice, but the fact was it happened. And in 1997, it was formalized. When the British flag came down and the PRC flag went up, that was not just a symbol, it was a reality. And that reality, in a, in a, in a strange sort of way, the Chinese actually wanted to keep the two systems as long as they could because they benefited from it and didn't even want to change it. They were quite happy to leave it as one country recognized as one country, but operating the two systems for the benefit of China and everybody else. And they were quite content with that, but they were always a little bit concerned as time went on that this one country was being set aside and what two, two systems was raised 
above one country. And that two systems are more important and more legitimate than one country. Now, the moment you have that thought, then I think the people who believe in one country cannot really accept that, not for long anyway. And when the demonstrations of the last two years in particular became more and more identified with a Hong Kong identity, even a Hong Kong nationality, the possibility of Hong Kong independence and foreign intervention to enable Hong Kong to be more independent, all these things came up. I think that was the last straw. And I think, the, and, and in so far as they still haven't uh, put aside two, two systems, and in so far as the one country is just to reaffirm, it has been like that since 1997, but to reaffirm it, but to help it along to make sure that this one country is recognized not only by legalists and politicians alone, but by the people of Hong Kong as a whole, and then they needed certain strong measures to make sure that this is firmly and undoubtedly legitimate. And I think these are now new factors. They're not, they were actually there before, but they're now being emphasized and attention is drawn to that. And lots of people don't like it, of course. The people who are committed to the, to the global city that, that Hong Kong has done so well by, uh, would not want to accept that because they are afraid of what this will do to their global networks, networking and so on, and the capacities that Hong Kong have enjoyed for so long. And I fully understand that. But this tension, to my mind, can only have one end. Because the one country, I think, has already been established in 1997. It is not something that was established in 2020 or 2020. It was in 1997. It is just in 2020 that the authorities in Beijing have made it explicit and made it now unmistakable and therefore has drawn attention to it in a way that makes a lot of people very unhappy. People who should know better now feel that they, they feel a sense of loss. But I think in reality, and to be historically correct, it is not new. It happened in 1997, and this has been reaffirmed. And it, it can be unpleasant for some people, but it, act, on the other hand, it can make other people more secure in the thought that we'll stop arguing about this now. Let's get on with it on the basis that it is one country. And if we can still have two systems in that one country, so be it, that is better than ever, better than nothing. I think this is something that uh, you have to relearn, maybe redefine it a bit. The finer points have to be worked out here and there, but I think it is entirely possible. Very realistic and very excellent uh, um, suggestion for Hong Kong to move forward. Time is up, I, we have to call it to a close. I just want to mention that there are two questions which I don't want to do with it. They are really great questions. One is Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore divided into, you know, the Chinese population, the Indian population, the, the, the Malays. What do we do? Uh, what is the future? The second question is your three children, one son, two daughters are all in Australia. And now uh, Australia is pretty, you know, anti-China uh, and, and then vice versa. So, so are you worried for them? They, their identity, I assume, are basically Australian because they moved there in 68 uh, and they were born in 59 to six, early 60s. So are you worried for them? What is your advice to your children uh, and grandchildren? So I'll leave it to, with, with you, uh, Gang Wu. You can take a minute if you'd like to answer those two questions or we'll call it quit. Let me say that when, when it comes to Australia, as far as I'm concerned, our, our children are Australians. They have never doubted their own loyalty to Australia and they will remain in Australia and make the most of it and do what they can to make sure that the Australians will behave well towards China and chi the Chinese and better than ever. I mean, I think this is, this is all they can hope for, but there is no question of being worried for them or being worried, this is that they have actually decided to do that and I think they are content with that. That is, a, that is where they belong. And that, that is, they work very hard to make that a happy place. Well, I hope, Gang Wu, that you'll be either you visit them or they will be able to visit you very soon because of uh, the COVID uh, ending, I hope. Uh, with that, I'll turn over to I'm not so hopeful when it ends. COVID sounds as if it's going to go on for a long time. I'm, I'm sorry. afraid so. <laughs> I'm afraid so. Uh, anyway, we're going to quit because we have another segment of the program, which is uh, the private VIP one. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to Alice. Alice? 
Thank you. Thank you, Ronnie, and thank you, Professor Wong. Um, I have to confess, as I was watching the program, I was in, uh, in tears because you, your wisdom uh, really reminds me of my own father who I just lost. And that's why I wish Margaret was with, with us uh, today because it would have been really interesting to also hear from her perspective. But I look forward to having you back uh, because of the program uh, we did with you uh, last year, talking about philosophy, a uh, really interesting subject. Uh, when you had a wonderful conversation with Professor Susan Lehman in, uh, uh, from uh, Berlin that we started, uh, I wanted to uh, make sure that this book, uh, the book that was launched last year was shared with our Asia Society um, Hong Kong members. And, uh, and as I watch your program, I hope we will have you back, Professor Wong, um, in, with perhaps our colleagues in Australia. And um, I think you mentioned the dual identity, uh, global and local, and that's certainly the uh, identity of Asia Society Hong Kong, whom you helped to found uh, in uh, 1990s uh, with, along with our founders. So I'm really, really, really grateful that you could be with us. So uh, the plug is for those of you who are not members, you're gonna miss an exciting half an hour of programming. Uh, private conversation, Professor Wong is gonna be with us, with our members. And some of the questions that Ronnie posed will be answered um, hopefully in the last, in the next half hour. So those of you who are not members, become a member. Um, I think it's very, very important uh, that we um, continue to support organization like Asia Society. Uh, we are gonna tell you more about our June 8th auction, uh, art auction and arts and cultural um, virtual gala. Unfortunately, uh, I agree with Professor Wong, uh, COVID is not going anywhere. Uh, with what's going on, we, will, we still need to raise funds and uh, our arts and cultural programming is more dynamic than ever. And I think uh, those of you who are in Hong Kong, you'll realize yesterday was the, um, start of our Basel, our central. Art is alive and well in Hong Kong and the Hong Kong artists, um, the Asian artists, artists have suffered uh, quite a bit like everyone else. So we're really, really grateful for the 40 plus, almost 50 artists who have donated their artwork. 50% of the proceeds from the art auction will go towards the, um, the artists who have donated their artwork. So please support us. Um, I'm not begging because I think Asia Society Hong Kong is, we have a, under our leadership, um, we are really, and especially the, the wonderful grounding and the, the establishment that Professor Wong has helped us uh, establish three years ago. We are, we are doing relatively well compared to other organizations, but I believe the artist really needs our support. Art and culture, um, and in some ways, one of the questions I wanna have Professor Wong back is really to talk about soft power of China and Chinese. And, and I think this is where arts and culture is really, um, it's kind of the soul of China. And I, it's something that we don't talk about enough. So I know I have some great ideas coming up for Professor Wong. Professor Wong, as long as you're staying in Singapore and you have access to Zoom, you're, we're gonna be calling out on you to have more discussion. So please support Asia Society Hong Kong uh, for our future programming. And we look forward to having you as a member. And I think um, on that, uh, also another plug, Allegiance. Uh, the program is brought to us, uh, I think, in May 28th and 31st. Um, this is an exciting musical that I actually saw it on Broadway. Allegiance is about the Japanese American internment um, in World War II. Uh, it's an issue that is, as a Chinese American, Asian American, I worried about when I was uh, working in the Museum of Chinese in America and looking at the current anti Asian. Um, hate around the world, not just in the United States, in Australia, in Europe, and, and Canada. This musical, done in 2015, uh, almost an all Asian cast, uh, have really has an interesting story for us to learn from. So we invite you to join us. And I have actually have a conversation with the famous uh, Japanese American actor, uh, Sulu, George Takei, uh, talking about his own personal internment camp, uh, in, internment story, which is, inspires his musical. He was interned as a five year old. Uh, along with his family in the in the United States. And things like that, I think the, the story is really worth telling. So I invite uh, those of you joining us for the watching the musical and the discussion with the, the cast member. Uh, George Akai on the 28th and Telly Long, as well as famous Leia Salonga, live from Manila, uh, discussion with us on the 31st. So that's enough plug for me. And I think, thank you, thank you, thank you for those of you who have joined us today. And uh, those of you who have signed on as uh, to stay with us for the next half hour, stayed on. You will be uh, welcome in uh, in the Zoom uh, chat room, uh, Zoom Zoom uh, webinar. So please do not leave us. Those of you who have committed to Asia Society, and I want to again thank all of you 
for joining us. And, and, and really, uh, thank you again, Professor Wong. The book is available. I highly, highly recommend it. And uh, it's really along the theme of, um, we've done several programs like this, uh, including Helen Xia, the uh, last boat out of Shanghai.